Hi, I'm Mike Warner, this year's president of the Greater Medina Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors. I would like to welcome you to the 2018 Candidates Forum in partnership with Medina TV. All candidates in contested races were invited to be interviewed. I'm pleased to be joined by Jared Fry of Medina TV for the interviews. We hope you find these interviews informative and helpful as you cast your vote. We'd like to welcome Anthony Gonzalez, candidate for Congress in the 16th District, to the Greater Medina Chamber of Commerce and Medina TV Candidates Forum. Let's begin by having you tell us about yourself. Great. Well, first off, thanks for having me. Uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, so, you know, I grew up in Northeast Ohio, son of Cuban immigrants. My, my father immigrated here in, uh, in 1960, had to escape the Castro regime uh, under some pretty difficult circumstances, but uh, came right here to, to Northeast Ohio and, and the year before I was born, uh, opened up a steel plant in uh, 1983. And um, that's kind of our, been our family business from, from day one. So I, I grew up in the steel business. I grew up in the manufacturing sector, kind of hearing about it around the dinner table and then going into work with him as well. Uh, and then, you know, my, my childhood, I went to St. Ignatius High School. I uh, was fortunate to earn a scholarship to play football for the Ohio State Buckeyes and one of my heroes, Jim Trestle, uh, before it was off to the NFL. Um, so five seasons uh, as a wide receiver with the Indianapolis Colts um, and then retired after quite a few injuries. Uh, went to business school, got my MBA at Stanford University, uh, ran a business for a few years um, before uh, deciding to, uh, to join the, the congressional fray. Uh, my wife and I uh, moved, moved back to Ohio um, to uh, you know, settle down. We're, we're in Rocky River right now and, and then, um, like I said, to, decided to, to get in to serve Northeast Ohio, a community that has meant so much to me and my family and has just given, given us so many gifts, um, incredible gifts. And so uh, time to give back and uh, excited to do it. Very good. Um, for the viewers at home, can you describe a little bit about the role in Congress and how you view it? Yeah, so I, I see the congressional role as, as essentially two things, right? Uh, the, the first and the primary function is to passionately fight for and advocate for your district at a legislative level. So making sure, for me, that means making sure that our trade deals are fair, uh, that we're putting our workers on an even playing field so that we can compete internationally in, in what is increasingly a very global economy. Uh, it's making sure our kids have the right education and skills that they need. Uh, whether that's you know in, in elementary school, the K-12 system, but but also making sure that we're promoting the right kinds of uh, post high school education, whether that's going into the trades or, or going to a four year college, if that's what makes sense for folks. Um, and then of course uh, the big elephant in the room, we have to get the cost of healthcare down. Um, and so I think that's kind of the the A priority is uh, the legislation for sure. Um, but another part of this job that I think is often overlooked that I'm really excited about uh, is the leadership component of this job. I think. Uh, as a member of Congress, you have a responsibility and obligation to tell your district story, to make sure that um, you're promoting the incredible things that are happening inside of Northeast Ohio, uh, and just being an advocate, being there to, to fight for you know, what I call next generation jobs, helping us, helping our economy grow, uh, helping us become a safer society, a more prosperous community, um, so that this will remain an incredible place uh, to raise a family. And, and that's, that's really, again, you kind of have the two components. You have the legislative pillar, but you also have the leadership pillar, and you have to do both. That's your obligation. And I think since you mentioned leadership, we'll kind of roll off of that. Uh, how do you think your leadership skills may be different from that of your opponent? You know, candidly, I, I don't I don't measure myself against against my mm -hmm. opponent in that sense. That's I don't. The way I measure myself is uh, based on my own standards. I, I have kind of the standards that have been set for me by, by my parents, my grandparents, and then reinforced in, in the, uh, the business world, but also on the football field. And, and so, um, you know, I, I like to think that I bring uh, a very unique perspective uh, as somebody who's kind of been in some different industries and had some success in some different places. Um, and, and I believe I bring a fresh, new perspective uh, to Congress in a place that is desperately ne in need of, of that specific thing. Um, and then a, a second point uh, I would make there is, uh, I think everybody almost across the country would agree that uh, our congressional culture is just broken. And, and a lot of that, um, I think you know, we, we need to do a lot internally in our own communities to make sure that we're, we're healing as a society and we're talking to each other in a way that's respectful and productive and allows us to kind of move forward as, as people. But, um, but I believe we need more people who are willing to go to D.C. Um, 
and able to go to D.C. and, and fight for policies, but do it in a way that's constructive, uh, in a way that's going to bring people together. I think that's probably the best thing you learn on the football field is you, know, you come together with people from all walks of life. It doesn't matter you know, where they're from. And, and you set a common goal and, and you go towards it. You put your differences aside, you work together, um, and, and you move forward because that's what, that's what the task demands. And I think we are at a, a point in our country's history uh, where we need that exact same mindset. Uh, we need people who understand, yes, we differ on policy, that's fine, um, but what we should never differ on is our commitment to our country, our commitment to our districts, and let's come together and, and try to move forward in, in a way that's productive, that gives the American people confidence in their in their Congress, because right now they don't have it. Right. And, and that's a great question, because I was, was going to follow up with that. In the same sense, well, you're right, there have been polls out there saying that the government system is broken and yep. looking for a way to fix that. I know you kind of gave a broad thing. Are there any specific ideas you might have in mind as a, as a way to fix that? Well, again, I, I think there are kind of two ways I would look at this. Um, one is I believe in just a bottoms-up system for our country. I think uh, change happens at the grassroots level and it works its way up. It doesn't happen top-down, in my opinion. Um, and so we as individuals in our communities, in how we talk to our neighbors, how we talk to people we disagree with, um, we have to bring that desire and that energy uh, to those conversations so that they can be had productively. Because right now, all we do is shout at each other. And if you get on social media, uh, that's a cesspool, it's even worse. Mm -hmm. um, and so we as a community, um, I think, all have to commit to having these conversations in a productive way. So culturally, we need to do our work, right? And I want to be a, a sort of a shining example of that. Um, and then as voters, I think we need to demand that from our representatives. That same ethos that we're talking about here, we need to demand that. The, one of the stark realities of Congress, every single one of those people uh, were duly elected. And, and so if we want a different mindset, if we want different leadership, uh, we have to start sending folks with a different attitude. And that's what I, I hope to, to bring to Congress. Yeah. Very good. Um, you mentioned a little bit about you know, your father's steel industry and, and uh, the different levels of whether somebody goes to college or goes into the trades. What do you think, because workforce is an issue in this region, Absolutely. Um, what, what do you think are your thoughts behind how you can help businesses with the workers they need? Yeah, so you know, everywhere that I go, every business leader that I talk to struggles with this. Um, the, the, the number one complaint I hear is either we don't have folks with the skill sets we need uh, or our people can't pass drug tests. Um, and I, I actually think those are related, but um, in any event. Uh, so I think you know, there's, there's some legislation we can do, uh, especially with, our, with respect to our community colleges. Um, I think we need to do a better job of promoting those and making sure that they get to play on a, on a playing field that makes sense for them. Right now, they're evaluated in the exact same format um, as a four-year college institution. Uh, and, and I think that places an undue burden on them and they get sort of failing grades, um, which don't make sense for them because they're, they're serving a different population, uh, they have different dynamics, and, and they're teaching different skills. So um, I think we need to be more thoughtful about how we talk about community colleges. Um, and, and then also, uh, I, I believe that we need to do a much better job of educating our kids and challenging our kids when they're in high school um, to start thinking about things like, like a return on investment for your education. Um, because ultimately, um, you know, if, if I see two problems, there's we're not teaching the right skills and, and then also the, the cost of college is just spiraling out of control. And, and I think uh, what we need there um, is a lot more competition for what people are doing when they leave high school. Um, and, and again, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. So my brother, uh, he went to a four-year college, uh, was a history major, and, and kind of went into the standard workforce um, trying to make it um, with, with that kind of background and did fine but but wasn't quite having the success that he wanted um, and so just recently he, he went back to school to become an electrician so he two-year program uh, become an electrician and, and he'll make more money doing that be able to provide for his family better as an electrician uh, than he ever would have been you know kind of going through the the other process so um, there are multiple avenues for success in this country uh, we need to make sure that we're promoting to our kids and, and our grandkids um, all the various options. Very good. Um, a few examples of some priorities um, 
uh, for government to pursue for businesses as well, too. Um, aside from the workforce, what other areas do you think you can help with businesses? Yeah, so, um, you know, I am a, a limited government, a sensible, light regulation uh, conservative. And uh, I think that's, that's the way that uh, you kind of free the private sector up to, to do the great work that it does and to spur innovation and to spur entrepreneurship and uh, get the job creators moving. Um, and, and I think uh, the, the Trump administration has done a fantastic job with Republican leadership of, of doing just that. And you're seeing it in the economy. You're seeing it in the numbers. This is an opinion, right? GDP is high. Um, unemployment's as low as it's ever been. We're finally seeing wages rise for the first time, really, since the 1970s. Um, it's been, they've just been stuck, and, and they're finally going up. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of great progress. Um, I think there are still some things we need to get, get right, though. Uh, we absolutely need to fix our trade deals. Um, specifically with China. Our, our trade environment uh, has, if you look at China, they've basically reached into communities like Northeast Ohio, pulled manufacturing jobs out, placed them in China, um, and, and kind of hollowed out our, our manufacturing sector. Um, and they've, we've allowed that to happen. Uh, we've allowed that to happen with the deals by not enforcing them, but also allowing them to steal intellectual property and things like that. So we absolutely have to fix our trade deals, um, but that's not enough. Uh, on top of that, we have to get the cost of health care down. It's crippling individuals, it's crippling businesses, and it's really holding us back. Um, there's no reason why our health care needs to continue to skyrocket at, at the rates that it does. Um, and if we get that down, uh, one, the American people will have a lot more faith in their government, sure. uh, which is critically important. Um, but two, it'll, it'll jumpstart our economy even more than it already has been. Mm -hmm. And you just talked about a lot of the issues I was going to ask you that kind of you were looking to, to tackling uh, if elected. What about in terms of the opioid, opioid crisis? What do you think can be done uh, if elected? Great question. I mean, everybody in Northeast Ohio, unfortunately, has a story about the opioid crisis, either devastating a neighbor or a, a friend or a family member or what have you. Um, and it's, it's the worst drug crisis I've ever seen in my life. Uh, the way that I see the opioid crisis is I see it as primarily a crisis of hope. I think people turn to opioids, um, turn to drugs uh, when other things in their lives have, have started to break down um, and, and they just are, are struggling to find um, you know, ways to be happy, unfortunately, and they turn to drugs. Um, and so to me, uh, I think there's a few things. Number one, um, I do believe if, if we get our economy humming, especially in Northeast Ohio, that will give people more hope, more prosperity, and, and maybe they won't turn to drugs as, as directly. Um, but for, you know, take that out for, for a second and talk directly about the issue um, at its core, I believe we need to invest in prevention programs uh, because the reality is once you get into the cycle of addiction, uh, that's the hardest place to turn back. That's, that's a lifelong journey. Uh, once you're addicted to drugs, um, you know, you're, you're going to be fighting that battle for literally the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we need to do everything we can to prevent folks from getting into the cycle of addiction. Uh, but then we also need to do things like secure our borders and make sure that the drugs that are coming in through Mexico, 90% of opioids in this country are coming directly through our southern border. Um, so we need to absolutely secure our border. That's why I support uh, President Trump's idea to build a wall, because I think it will be effective and it's been effective anywhere else walls have been built um, acro across the world. Uh, it'll be effective at preventing the drugs from coming in um, and then also working on treatment programs for those who have kind of gone into it. But I think strong economy, if I could summarize the, my, it's a lot of words there, but <laughs> if I could summarize, um, strong economy will, will give people hope. Mm -hmm prevention programs from preventing people from getting into the cycle to begin with, a strong border to prevent the, the drugs from coming in, and then uh, relaxing some restrictions on treatment programs to giving people more options um, to get out of the cycle once they're in. Sure. Mm -hmm. Now, if elected, how do you see yourself handling the balance between needs of local constituents, state, and, and, and the bigger uh, picture? How do you work that balance? Great question. Um, you know, I actually just met with, with Congressman Renacci on this very specific topic. Uh, my commitment to the voters, I, I don't promise anything that I don't think I can deliver. Uh, my promise to the voters everywhere I've been is we will have outstanding constituent services. Uh, the one thing you'll know about our office is that we'll be available. We will solve your problems if somebody needs a Social Security check processed, if a veteran needs to get help, uh, if somebody needs help with their Medicare, passports, visas, whatever it is. Our office is going to be present and accountable, and, and people are going to love coming to our office because we're going to be helpful. Um, and I think that uh, it speaks to the leadership component of this job. Uh, if you're going to do it right, you need to deliver on the constituent services. Um, and, then, and then again, you know, our, our campaign, 
both in the primary and in the general election, has been focused on the district. Uh, we have purposely ignored jumping into every national conversation uh, and, and kind of chasing after national endorsements um, that don't really mean anything for the 16th district. Uh, I want individual voter endorsements. I want mayor endorsements. I want city council endorsements. I want the people in this community uh, who have made it so great. Uh, I want them to support my candidacy. And, and then, in turn, I will then serve um, with that exact same mindset. Okay. Very good. Well, is there anything else you'd like the viewers to know when they come to vote? this year? Well, they have to vote for me. <laughs> no, but uh, in all seriousness, no, I, I, um, first off, I thank the voters for, uh, for watching this. Um, I hope that you find my story compelling. One promise that I will make to you, uh, I will fight every single day uh, for Northeast Ohio, for our future, for our jobs, uh, for our economy, uh, and then my office will be a place uh, of refuge, a place that you can come to get your problem solved in hopes that, uh, at least with this one congressperson, um, you will have your faith in the federal government and Congress restored. That is my commitment to you. I'll do everything uh, to work on your behalf, and, and uh, I would be honored to have your vote. Well, Anthony, we appreciate your time today, and we wish you the best of luck this November. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.